no sé qué será la Buenos días. Um, si os parece, vamos a comenzar la, la parte del, del programa de, de educación superior relativa a dimensión internacional. Os recuerdo que estamos eh, transmitiendo esta sesión en streaming, por lo cual eh, os rogaría que los teléfonos móviles los tuvierais o en silencio o apagados. Y, eh, en segundo lugar, me, me hacen otras dos eh, advertencias desde de, de, el punto de vista logístico, que, eh, que, que hay que volver a firmar hoy el, el, el listado de asistencia, aunque os registraréis ayer, lo recuerda el Departamento de Comunicación y por favor hacerlo. Y en segundo lugar, eh, os agradeceríamos que nos siguierais eh, tuiteando en el hashtag eh, EPLUS16. Me toca a mí presentar esta, esta parte del programa de hoy y, en primer lugar, quisiera agradecer especialmente la presencia de los representantes de la, de la Comisión Europea, de Claudia Modino y, sobre todo, del doctor Graham Wilkie, al cual, y me va a perdonar, le hice un atraco, él me va a entender perfectamente, la semana pasada en Bruselas, que fue cogerlo a lazo. O sea, que, thank you very much, Graham, thank you very much, Claudia. Y también, también me gustaría agradecer la presencia de los representantes de los NEOS de Azerbaiyán, Serbia y Ucrania, que nos acompañan hoy. Y thank you very much. Y Túnez, por supuesto. Bueno, a mí, Mohamed. Bonjour. Shukran. Eh, y eh, además, eh, de tantas, de todos vosotros. Por ser lo más breve posible, el programa de, de hoy que hemos rectificado lo tenéis aquí, si esto quisiera, no, ahora disponible eh, funcionar. A continuación de mi intervención tendremos la, 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 la presentación que hará el doctor Graham Wilkin, al cual, insisto, le vuelvo a agradecer enormemente su, su presencia el día de hoy. Y luego eh, tendremos una intervención por parte de Claudia Mondino, de la, de la Agencia Ejecutiva, como, como señalamos anteriormente, para posteriormente tener una intervención de los representantes de los NEOS de Túnez, Ucrania, Serbia y Azerbaiyán, que una vez que termine el café tendrán una charla fuera de, estas, de, de, de esta sala y fuera para que podáis mantener conversaciones bilaterales con ellos. Para finalizar luego con la nueva intervención del doctor Graham, thank you very much, y de Loreta Palauskasti, que es la representante de nuestra en el punto de, de contacto internacional. Dicho lo cual, me toca a mí ser muy breve, sobre todo porque mi voz no, no me lo va a permitir hablar mucho, y lo que viene después es lo más, lo más interesante. Los resultados de la, de la convocatoria de, de este año de 2016 en acciones centralizadas lo tenéis disponible en nuestra página web. Tenemos una página web ad hoc para los resultados de las acciones centralizadas, donde viene el conjunto de la información y el presupuesto actualizado de la convocatoria 2017. No me voy a tener más ahí. Incluso tenéis un informe que hemos hecho de la participación actualizado, si no me equivoco, Loreta, al mes de diciembre de… Exacto, bien, mi cabeza no falla, de la participación en las acciones centralizadas. Ahí lo tenéis, en la participación, yo no me voy a tener mucho en ello, simplemente decir que están muy bien los resultados, aunque, y me vais a entender, siempre se puede mejorar y es nunca es suficiente, así que habrá que hacerlo mucho mejor si cabe el año, el año que viene. Convocatoria 2017 de Erasmus 2017. Como ya sabéis, y lo señalamos ayer, 
en la jornada de la mañana, pero para aquellos que no pudisteis acudir, se publicó el pasado 20 de octubre en la página web de la comisión y ya tenemos publicada la guía del programa en castellano y en, y en formato HTML, está en inglés, donde podéis acceder fácilmente a las distintas secciones de la guía del programa. Y la convocatoria, por supuesto, también está publicada. Los plazos de presentación han variado solamente los relativos a las acciones de movilidad. Ahí lo no, eso no son, son los que nos han variado. Son el 2 de febrero de 2017, 12 horas hora de Bruselas, exactamente la misma fecha que el año pasado. Los que sí varían son los que tenéis marcados en rojo, empezando por acciones estratégicas y el resto varían ligeramente, pero es importante que no os olvidéis de las fechas correspondientes. En cuanto al presupuesto de acciones centralizadas para el año que viene previsto, ahí lo tenéis. Pues hay un incremento sustancial en los títulos conjuntos de las Mundo y una ligera eh, variación a la baja de las actividades de Jamoni, simplemente para que lo tengáis. Otra cuestión que queríamos señalar son de la, la, la movilidad internacional de créditos, o K107, que tenéis los proyectos que tenemos abiertos ahora mismo de las dos convocatorias 2015-2016. Tenemos proyectos con 80 países, no está mal, es, eh, y espero que podáis ejecutar los proyectos de una manera muy razonable y eh, si hay algún problema o alguna cuestión, espero que os hayamos ayudado a ir solventándola poco a poco. Es el segundo año de ejecución, espero que el, que, que el tercero será, será bastante mejor. ¿Y qué novedades hay para la convocatoria del año siguiente? Ahí lo tenemos, se incorporan y ahora veremos, hay un nuevo sobre para Irán, Irak y Yemen, ahí lo tenéis marcado en azul oscuro, los, los tres países, con lo cual solamente nos quedan muy pocos fuera del de programa Arabia Saudita y alguno más. No, de, de memoria ya no creo que no me sé ni, ninguno más. Con lo cual, esto significa que para el año que, que viene tenemos un aumento presupuestario razonable. Hay un sobre adicional para Oriente Medio, que se refería para Irán, Irak y Yemen. Por eso hoy nos acompañará a, dentro de un rato el embajador de la, de la República Islámica de Irán, para presentarnos el sistema universitario de su país y contaremos con el ejemplo de buena práctica de la Universidad de Alicante, por ahí veo a Antonio, que es voluntario para Forfoso, es lo que hay, para presentarnos su experiencia con Irán. También, y es una novedad muy destacable, lo tenéis también marcado en rojo, el sobre adicional para Túnez, que, que se ha establecido por parte de la Comisión Europea, ahí lo tenéis marcado en en, en, en destacado y esto ha significado que en, en el ámbito europeo en los próximos dos años se van a destinar más de 10 millones de euros a Túnez. España tiene 700.000 euros adicionales, somos el segundo país en cuanto a fondos, tras Francia que tiene 900.000 euros, nosotros tenemos 700.000 y eh, Alemania tiene medio millón de euros en acciones de movilidad internacional. Por lo tanto, somos la segunda agencia en adquirir el compromiso y espero y deseo, estoy seguro, que nos vamos a gastar todos los euros de este sobre adicional, por nuestro bien conjunto. ¿Esto qué ha significado? Pues que tuviéramos… A ver, ahora, esto ya lo he contado, pero bueno, la, la información la tenéis disponible, no me quiero extender yo mucho. Y también significa que tenemos, como señalaba anteriormente, una nueva región de… En Oriente Medio, ahí lo tenéis marcado, Irán, Irak y Yemen, con, también con este sobre de 253.489 euros, si mi cabeza no, no falla en cuanto a, esta, a este reparto. Ahora, ¿qué hemos hecho con estos dos sobres adicionales que, que tenemos? El primero de ellos, que es el caso de Túnez, el pasado mes de noviembre nos desplazamos a Túnez, una delegación de 13 universidades acompañados por, por el SEPIE, yo creo que los que me acompañaron vieron que fue un éxito la, la reunión, no puedo dejar más que eso, fue una sesión organizada por la, por la, por la Comisión Europea en Túnez. Eh, Mohamed, merci beaucoup, ça a été vraiment gentil, votre accueil a, a Mohamed. Uh, y eh, sirvió de ejemplo de cómo yo creo que hemos hecho las cosas, de luego la delegación más numerosa, voy a, voy a presumir ahora, y con envidia de algún otro país que no diré el nombre, que se sentía muy a disgusto de que estuviéramos allí. Me vais a permitir el, la pequeña broma. 
Y luego tuvimos, durante esos dos días, aprovechamos para no solamente la jornada del de, Infodei que hizo la Comisión Europea, sino que también eh, tuvimos una, una reunión en nuestra, en nuestra embajada con representantes de las distintas eh, instituciones tunefinas, con, tres, con 14 universidades de Túnez, el día posterior al Infodei. Yo creo que, además, que… Eh, la, nuestra embajada allí está muy implicada en el desarrollo de, de este sobre y yo creo que es el ejemplo de las, de las cuestiones cómo tenemos que seguir trabajando en el desarrollo de este tipo de acciones. También hemos tenido un seminario de contacto al cual se participó con los países de, 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 INE, de ENI Este, con, también con la, con la presencia de 10 eh, universidades españolas, si mi cabeza no, no falla ahora mismo, 8 eh, tengo, tengo, tengo mis notas, ya la memoria ya no es lo, lo que era, que también creo que fue muy, muy fructífera y yo pues, eh, quiero, es un ejemplo más de cómo tenemos que seguir trabajando en este ámbito. Otras novedades que os queremos contar son los grupos de trabajo de aquí, ahora, los grupos de trabajo de dimensión internacional. Estamos participando en dos grupos de, de, de trabajo de, de dimensión internacional dentro del marco del de programa. Ahí lo tenéis marcado, junto con distintos países. El primero de ellos ha habido tres reuniones en el año 2016 y en el segundo de ellos una reunión está prevista en 2017 para el primer trimestre. ¿Qué es lo que se ha visto en estos dos grupos? Pues en el primero de ellos… Se ha discutido de la nueva distribución de fondos a partir del año 2018, qué mejoras se pueden ir implementando en las herramientas de gestión, por ejemplo, el dashboard, la multitud, etcétera. Y creo que se está discutiendo, y no revelo nada que no deba hacer, la apertura a prácticas para el año 2018 en esta movilidad internacional de, de créditos. Es más, eh, yo creo, quiero en la reunión de directores informales que tuvimos antes de la, de la reunión de agencias nacionales el pasado miércoles, discutimos esta cuestión y también trasladamos la necesidad y aprovecho la, la presencia de los representantes de la Comisión Europea aquí de la petición de las universidades españolas de ampliar, si cabe, un poco más la duración de estos programas de, de movilidad a más años que, para tener mayor estabilidad. Y así lo hicimos en el Grupo Internacional, aparte de, de discutir otros asuntos. También va a haber un seminario de contacto de Inisur el próximo mes de octubre en Florencia, organizado por la Agencia Italiana, y aprovecharemos para tener una reunión cuatrilateral entre Francia, España, Italia y Portugal para hablar de, de este tipo de, de, de cooperación en el Mediterráneo, entre los países eh, juntando a Portugal, que formamos parte del Mediterráneo, con lo cual ya os haremos llegar la, la información correspondiente en su momento dado, que la, la, el, el pasado jueves y viernes hablaba yo con la directora de la agencia italiana en, en Bruselas, que tenía muchísimo interés y todos tenemos mucho interés en mejorar la, la, la comunicación entre, nos, entre los, nuestros distintos países, que tantos intereses comunes tenemos en, en, en el Mediterráneo. El otro grupo de trabajo que, es, eh, que tenemos eh, en, en movilidad internacional, también hemos estado hablando de la flexibilización de las eh, movilidades y de la implementación de auditorías de sistemas, no todo tiene que ser tan, tan bonito, eh, en coherencia con el sistema de K103. Y en este sentido también eh, quiero deciros que la guía de agencias nacionales para 2017 se está evaluando la posibilidad de hacer visitas de seguimiento in situ por parte a este tipo de, de movilidad internacional de, de créditos. Es decir, estamos trasladando el esquema de K103 o la movilidad normal al nuevo sistema. No me quiero extender mucho más porque ya estamos, eh, hemos empezado con un ligero retraso y que la idea es que terminemos a la hora en punto, al mediodía. Insisto, lo que viene detrás de mí es lo más trascendente. Voy a ser muy breve en otras cuestiones. Yo creo que para renaceros el, eh, en el ámbito de internacionalización tenemos el programa de becas con el Gobierno de Paraguay, que se puso en marcha este pasado mes de junio septiembre, firmado el mes de julio. Es un programa piloto que se ha hecho de momento con tres universidades y se va a ampliar seguramente el año que el curso que viene a, a dos más y si es posible a tres más. Está saliendo bastante bien. El programa de prácticas con Estados Unidos, piloto también, con, que participan 13 universidades cuya fase de selección de estudiantes ha finalizado hace relativamente poco y están en fase de recepción de ofertas los estudiantes por parte de las empresas correspondientes. Recientemente yo estuve en 
Argentina y el gobierno argentino nos anunció que quieren lanzar un programa de eh, másteres binacionales entre España y otros países como puede ser Italia, Bélgica, Polonia y demás allá, sobre todo en el ámbito de ciencias sociales. Os dirigiremos una petición de información próximamente para que nos digáis qué tipo de másteres tenéis de conjuntos con otros países en este ámbito, puesto que el Gobierno argentino tiene muchísimo interés en este ámbito. Y por último, pero no menos importante, el plan de promoción que queremos implementar en los próximos años que hemos recibido comentarios a través del, del Grupo de Trabajo de Internacionalización recientemente. Finalmente, me gustaría hacer un pequeño balance de dos programas que se han cerrado este año, por desgracia, que son el de Ciencias sin Fronteras, que ahí lo tenéis, está más de 3.334 alumnos y 1.577 hicieron prácticas. El Gobierno brasileño está evaluando e lanzar un nuevo programa, está todavía en fase previa, eh, cuando tengamos información al respecto os la, os la haremos llegar, pero su idea es retomar a un nivel, desde luego, no tan, con tanto volumen como tenía este, el nuevo programa de, de eh, salida de esos estudiantes fuera. Y el otro que se clausuró el pasado día 30, el día, perdón, el día próximo, el, el pasado 1 de 2 de, 2 de diciembre en Guayaquil fue el programa de maestrías de formación del profesorado del Ecuador que ha pedido formar a más de 5.000 profesores ecuatorianos. Pero no todo lo que se cierra, hay cosas nuevas, estamos explorando un, nuevas vías de movilidad académica con Chile, con Conefit, que todos los conocéis, también con el gobierno uruguayo, seguramente firmaremos algo en la próxima prim primavera con el gobierno de Uruguay y también tenemos en fase muy avanzada algún programa piloto con, la, con el gobierno filipino. En cuanto tengamos información al respecto, os lo haremos llegar de la manera más pronto posible. Y por último, pero no menos importante, el calendario de ferias para el año que viene. Estas son las más relevantes. Como bien sabéis, EIE eh, se celebra este año en Sevilla y eh, al ser en nuestro país vamos a tener una presencia mucho mayor, desde luego, tanto por parte de lo que es SEPI en sí como de las universidades, eh, creo, por las que he ido hablando, todas quieren participar. En cuando tengamos la información actualizada os, os la haremos llegar. Ahí tenéis las ferias que hay en Studying Europe de momento convocadas, que son Uzbekistán, Nigeria en mayo y Jordania en el mes de, de septiembre. Y, por supuesto, este año NAFSA, que se celebra en Los Ángeles, el cual estamos trabajando en, eventualmente en celebrar algún tipo de acto paralelo y que sea complementario a NAFSA, que también os lo haremos llegar. Y luego, <coughs> perdón, eh, va, va a haber una feria similar a la que se produjo en México, en México el pasado mes de noviembre. Vamos a celebrar una en Brasil, en Sao Paulo, Río de Janeiro, los próximos 10 y 13 de marzo. Y en Marruecos, a lo largo del mes de abril, organizado con, conjuntamente con las consejerías de educación que tenemos en los dos países por parte de SEPIE. Yo no me voy a extender mucho más allá. Dije que iba a ser más o menos respetuoso con el, con el tiempo. Eh, más o menos lo, lo he cumplido. Muchísimas gracias por todo. Lo más importante, insisto, es lo que viene a continuación. A mí me tenéis muy visto y a los demás no, lo, no tal. Aprovechar la presencia aquí de los representantes tanto de los países de Azerbaiyán, Túnez, Serbia o Ucrania, así como de los dos representantes de la Comisión Europea, para hacerles las preguntas que, que consideréis, aprovecharos de su experiencia porque no siempre es fácil que se puedan desplazar a Madrid y yo insisto, es muy interesante que estén hoy aquí. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Good morning, everyone. Um, I can't see you. I've got a bright light on my face, so um, feel free to wave, pull faces, do this. Um, I can't see you anyway. It's fine. Um, before I start, thank you very much to um, Pablo, Maria, uh, Jose Manuel, Loretta um, for the invitation. We're really grateful. One thing we do very well in, in the commission um, is concentrate on problems. And sometimes we forget to um, celebrate good practice. So I'm here today not to do the first, but to, uh, to celebrate good practice. You saw 
when uh, Pablo was uh, talking about the uh, working groups, for example, that um, Spain is very active. And uh, it's true that in terms of the national agencies, um, we would count probably two as best practice um, that we constantly quote, um, so Spain and, and Germany. And uh, I was speaking to Loretta, um, who was in uh, Brussels last week for our meeting of um, the international working group. And, uh, and she was saying that um, some of the smaller countries um, are a little bit jealous because um, when we're discussing issues, um, when we're trying to identify best practice, when we, um, we're looking at finding solutions to problems, we have the, the unfortunate reflex to turn to, to Germany and, and Spain and a couple of others and say, what do you think? Um, rather than say, who has ideas? So um, we, we have to be mindful not to, not to play favorites, but I'm playing favorites here um, today, and I'm very, very happy to, to be here in Madrid for your, for your day. Fabulously well organized. I participated yesterday afternoon. And um, again, to the colleagues, thank you very much for inviting us. So um, I'm just going to give you a quick run through. In fact, um, the presentation from Pablo gave you a very good flavor of um, where we are. Um, but uh, I'll give you the kind of general overview. I think probably quite a lot of it will be familiar. Um, so just, just to start with um, kind of the budget to situate you. So we have um, four actions that we consider to be particularly international in um, Erasmus+. Plus. You know them. Uh, Jean Monnet, um, capacity building, Erasmus Mundus joint degrees, and the international staff and student credit mobility, which we call international credit mobility. It's not a particularly good name, but it's easier to say than, than all that. And the, the interesting thing is the, the budget amounts are up here for the whole program, um, but they're, they're from different sources. So in fact, although we have um, around uh, a billion euros for um, Erasmus Mundus um, joint degrees, uh, more than 700 million of that comes from the, what we call, boringly, heading one budget. So that the, the, uh, <laughs> the standard budget, the 14.7 billion budget for Erasmus Plus, internal funds, funds the vast majority of Erasmus Mundus joint degrees and the vast majority of uh, Jean Monnet. Um, so even though they're international actions, they're funded with what we call our domestic budget. Um, the other two actions, so um, credit mobility and capacity building, they're funded by our external action um, budgets. And as you know, um, that those budgets come with a lot of strings and conditions and uh, Nobody in their right mind would have devised uh, a scheme where we get a uh, budget for, for one action from five different sources with five different sets of rules. But for this program, we're stuck with it. Um, and so that's why we need the help of the national agencies, um, Spain, Germany, France, Italy, to identify what the problems are and, and how we can solve them. So to talk about um, credit mobility, um, you know, we've had two calls so far. Um, we have around 130 million a year. This year it'll be um, slightly more. We don't have definitive figures for this year. Um, not all the national agencies spent their budgets. Um, you can imagine who the offenders are. The UK, France had about two million each left. Um, Spain spent all their money. They could have spent five times as much, I suspect. Um, <laughs> And actually, that's interesting because uh, next year, so the current call, 2017, will be the last time that we divide the budget um, evenly, um, just according to um, size of the country and size of the student population. Because we see this isn't working particularly well. It's very democratic. Everybody gets their fair share. But then what happens is some countries, like Spain, spend it like this and could spend much more. And other countries can't spend all we give them, no matter how hard they try. So from 2018, we will essentially take the budget from the countries who cannot spend it and give it to countries who can spend it. So. <laughs> I feel like a shameless populist. Um, <laughs> No, it's, 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 it's common sense. It's, it's not because we're kind and we want to do something good for you. It's because, it's because we get criticized when the budget is not spent. So it's, it's, it's purely self-interest. Um, we're, we're not that nice. 
Um, so basically, we, we have, budget-wise, we have two big problems. We have um, high budgets for regions that are perhaps less interesting for a lot of countries. And so this is the European neighborhood where it's a, a huge political objective of the European Union to strengthen and modernize higher education institutions in those countries. So the budgets are very, very big. And then we have the other case where we have enormous demand, um, never higher than in Spain for Latin America, um, and small budgets. So for, for industrialized countries generally, for um, developing Asia, um, for Latin America. Um, so. The, the, the Spanish example with Latin America is the one I always use to talk um, about the mismatch between um, budget and demand. And Loretta will correct me, but I think there were something like 16 applications for, for each proposal that the national agency was willing to fund, um, willing, able to fund um, each year, just because you know, of the long history of, um, of cooperation. And this is, to a lesser extent, repeated across all the national agencies. So the budgets we have for Latin America or for North America or for industrialized Asian countries are pathetic because this is not a political priority um, for, for the European Union. The political priority is the neighborhood. Um, and of course, this mismatch causes problems. So I don't, <laughs> I don't have a solution, but I want you to know that we, we're aware of this and, and we were aware from the beginning, but these are the rules of the game. Our only other option was to say no to the, to the very small budgets. And it's interesting that the budget that we have this year for the 2017 call, which is new for, um, we call it DCI, so Development Cooperation Instrument, jargon, um, Middle East. So it's for Iran, Iraq, Yemen, Pablo mentioned it. Um, this was a budget which we considered too small to open up to credit mobility um, for the first two years. Um, and it's only this coming year because of the thaw in relations with, with Iran, that it's considered to be, even though it's tiny, so Spain will get 200, or we'll talk about it later, but Spain will get about 250,000 euros, so it's, it's teeny tiny, but symbolically it's very important because politically we want to show um, these countries that uh, we want to encourage cooperation between higher education institutions. So sometimes we, we have to do things which are enormously suboptimal in order for, um, to send a political message. So for credit mobility, the, these numbers you see are just uh, the numbers of uh, mobilities planned. Um, so 2015, 2016, uh, 28,000 planned in 2015, around um, 34,000 planned in 2016. Um, this is literally just a function of the budget available. It's more than we thought it would be because um, in the lower part of the, the, um, the graph, you see that the, the ratio between staff and learners is 50-50. And we never expected this, never in our wildest dreams, actually. Um, we call it credit mobility because we imagined it would be like um, KA 103. It would be 90% student, 10% staff um, as a minimum. But of course, these, these things have to start slowly. I mean, in many cases, these are new partnerships. It's not like you guys with, with Latin America where you've got you know, decades of, of experience. Um, in many cases, we're talking about um, new partnerships. So you start with staff. It, it makes sense. And this was a message that we were, we were passing at Info Days in, in 2014, 2015. But we don't, we, normally people, people don't listen um, to us anyway. So we were saying this thinking it was a good thing. And, uh, and we're actually delighted to see that it's, it's kind of 50-50 um, staff students. And that means that we can fund um, much more mobilities because staff mobilities generally are cheaper than, than the average student mobility. The, the average for staff mobilities is about 2,000 euros per mobility. Um, and the average for students is about 6,000. So the average overall, because it's 50-50, is about 4,000 euros per mobility. And this is, this is much better. We'd estimated at the beginning of the program that the average would be about 6,000, taking a kind of typical student mobility. So this is good news for us, if it happens. I mean, these are planned, and we know that you know, uh, it takes time to get going. The other interesting thing is um, the kind of split between uh, incoming um, to Europe, which at the moment is planned to be about 2 thirds of the mobilities, and outgoing from Europe to partner countries 
um, and the planned numbers are about one third at the moment. There are particular, you know this, but there are particular problems with two of our funding sources. So the Development Cooperation Instrument and the um, European Development Fund. Um, so Development Cooperation Instrument um, covers all the countries uh, on the board except um, the ones in Sub-Saharan Africa and EDF covers um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we, we have particular problems um, fitting these budgets into our scheme because um, legally this money has to count as the European Union's overseas development aid. And the OECD, in their infinite wisdom, um, say that you cannot send European students at short cycle, first cycle or second cycle to these countries and count it as development aid. So we're a little bit stuck. You know this because you know, that you're applying for these funds. But it, it, this itself skews the, the direction of, uh, uh, of mobility. So um, what, we, what we see is that we, um, some countries, um, a, a minority, make available the, uh, their, their regular um, intra-European budget um, to fund outgoing uh, European students to these countries, but not all, because as they're keen to tell us, the countries themselves are quite stretched with the inter-European budget. So um, there's, there's no way around this. It's not ideal, but we have to live with it. There are also targets. So as I say, this money doesn't just come um, given to us and say, do what you like with it. That would be a, a dream. Um, a dream um, for two regions in the world for the um, DCI so for the development cooperation instrument we have hard targets which not per national agency but over overall in Europe and over the seven years we have to hit so for Asia we have a number of target countries where we have to spend a minimum and these countries are the least developed so Afghanistan Bangladesh Cambodia Laos Nepal Bhutan Myanmar and we have to avoid spending too much money on um, China and India in, in that region. For Latin America, same story. We, we're obliged, we've made a political promise to spend um, a proportion of the money on the poorest countries. So Bolivia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, Paraguay. Um, and limit the amount of money that we spend on Brazil and Mexico. And in terms of, of message, 2015, um, we didn't do so well with those targets. 2016 was much better, so we're moving in the right direction. Um, what we tend to see is that people have got the message about avoiding um, China and India and Brazil and Mexico, but we're not yet at a situation where we're comfortable with the least developed countries. Instead, the money is moved to the middle-income countries, which is normal, um, they're more developed. Um, so we're keeping an eye on it. But I mention it here because we count, as you can imagine, quite a lot for the, for, for the Latin America um, targets on, on you guys. Um, because many, many countries in Europe have no history of cooperation with these, with these countries. You know, Bolivia, El Salvador, Guatemala. Um, and um, so we lean quite heavily on, on this, the Spanish National Agency, who naturally receives dozens of proposals for all the countries in Latin America. So. Um, it's just a reminder that if you have good projects with, with these countries, all things being equal, they're more likely to be funded. So what's, what's new in um, 2017? Not, not a huge amount, and you've been told already. We have two additional what we call windows, so geographical envelopes, one for Tunisia and one for um, Iran, Iraq, Yemen, so DCI Middle East. Um, these are both political. Um, and they're both in order to increase our political cooperation as part of a package of actions at the level of the, of the European Commission. So it's not restricted to um, uh, higher education. We're also doing things in a lot of other sectors with, um, with these countries. Um, so extra money for, the, for these two regions. And it doesn't affect you guys because you didn't use the flexibility this year. You didn't need to but lots of countries will be crying because uh, lots of national agencies because we will not have a second round next year. So basta with a second round. Um, they're, a, they're a pain. 
Um, it, it's normal at the beginning of an action that you need extra time to implement it. Um, but already in the second year, we saw this, this year that's uh, 2016, that many countries had made huge improvements. Um, as I say, you could have spent your budget several times over. There was no need to open an extra round in, in September. So, but that, that will cause um, lots of crying next year, I'm sure. But it's our only way to establish early in the year how much money we're going to have for 2018, because here now, it's what, the 20th of December, we still don't know what our final budget is for the call in 2017. So the figures that you've seen is our baseline budget, and then we know that we will be adding money to that coming from the national agencies who haven't spent all their money, and we still don't have those figures. Um, so it's not really very acceptable for us that we don't know less than two months before the deadline how much the money will be. The good news, it, it can only go up, um, but we want to, to arrive at a situation where by the summer, at the latest by September next year, we know exactly how much we've got in 2018, and we can distribute it according to ability to spend the budget next year. So this, this is, you know this, so the, these, these are the, um, the, the different uh, envelopes, the different uh, regions, and you see that there's a huge, uh, something like 55% of our budget goes on the neighborhood, so the Western Balkans, the uh, ENI South, the ENI East, and then we have um, some reasonably large budgets, DCI Asia, um, Russia is quite large, and then a whole series of um, much, much smaller ones, which are largely oversubscribed. Um, not ideal, but that's the money that we've got, unfortunately. And this, how does that translate into, into numbers? Well, now that we have more, a better idea of what the average um, cost of a mobility is, we see that it, it, it turns into you know, about 6,000 uh, mobilities in the Western Balkans, which is enormous. Um, 5,000 in the ENI East, um, over 6,000 in the ENI South, down to um, 400 mobilities for South Africa, divided by 33 national agencies. Now, here's a really good example of a situation where the Commission said, there's nothing we can do with that money. We will use it for capacity building, or we will use it for um, joint degrees. And the government themselves, the, the South African government, said, no, we really, really want to have credit mobility um, because it will allow our universities to reach parts of Europe they've never, they've never worked with before. Um, so we reluctantly agreed, but it means that there are more than 20 national agencies who, for this budget, have about 20,000 euros. So they can send three people. Um, it's really not ideal. So, I've already given you all the advice because I can't keep a secret. Um, so, obviously, target envelopes with, with bigger budgets, that's, that's where the money is. Your success rate for Latin America this year was something around 5 or 6%, um, whereas the success rate for the Eastern Partnership or the Western Balkans was in the 70%, 80%. So, all things being equal, Maybe they're, they're less attractive countries for you, or you have less of a history of working with them, but that's where the money is. Um, go for less usual suspects. Um, newcomers, I mean, this, this message, I think, has been internalized. Think about staff mobility, be obviously, before you think about student mobility, either incoming or outgoing. Um, we encourage everybody from the start to go for the longest contract length. And uh, the, the standard contract is now 26 months. Go for that. Don't go for a shorter contract. It always takes longer. You know this. It always takes longer to get these things up off the ground. With the best will on both sides, there are always problems. And it's insanely complex with visas and with inter-institutional agreements. So give yourself the flexibility. Be as precise as you can in the quality questions. And that means not being precise about what your internationalization strategy is, because um, we know you've got a good internationalization strategy. Talk more, if you can, about what the, the strategy is for your partners. We know you will tell us about your strategy, and we know it will be well developed and well thought out. Um, what will make the difference between you and your neighbor in the, in the evaluation is, is how well you incorporate the views of the, of the partner countries. And, it goes without saying, as much as you can involve your partners. 
There's lots of um, documents. I mean, you, you know there's lots of documents on the um, CEPIA website. We've produced some, some other quick guidance. Some of this has been updated this week. I've been seeing emails from my colleagues back in Brussels. So there's a kind of do's and don'ts, a quick reference guide for partner country HEIs. And these things are just the, the bare basics um, for HEIs who don't know. You, you, you have 30 years of working with Erasmus, so you know um, what to do. But for, for many, many countries around the world, um, this is brand new, and they want to know really just the, the very, very simple stuff. And so we tried to make documents which are um, in the easiest possible language. So they're not in high hope, they're not in commission ease. Um, what is in commission ease is the, the 350 page Erasmus Plus program guide, which I recommend if ever you have trouble sleeping, um, start, start reading that. Um, it can put me to sleep in between three and four minutes. Okay, that was, that was quite a lot about um, credit mobility. I'll be, I'll be quicker with um, key action two. So um, capacity building, what I'm not going to talk about, I should just say, is I'm not going to talk about Erasmus Mundus um, because we have um, Claudia here. Um, and why, why would you ask the monkey when you can have the organ grinder? So let's, let's get the, uh, the expert to talk about Erasmus Mundus. But I'll talk about capacity building, um, general trends. Um, we started off quite slowly, um, 450 applications in the first call um, last year. And um, it was exactly what you would expect. Lots of applications for world regions where we had a long and continuous history of capacity building. So the Tempus area, fine. Um, uh, Latin America, fine, because of the Alpha program. Um, Asia, a disaster, because um, it had been 10 years since we did um, Asia Link. Um, and so we, were, we didn't even manage to spend all the budget that we had for Asia. Um, much better in 2016. Um, so the, much better for us, less good for you, because we're funding the same amount of projects um, every year, but now the, um, the numbers of applications are going up. So um, in the first year, we were funding kind of one in three, and now we're funding barely one in four. Um, but in terms of the geography, which is what we're interested in, um, we went from 61 countries in 2015 to more than 100 in 2016. And we had good coverage of Asia last year. And Asia, for instance, is the, the biggest single budget envelope in the call this year, around 40 million. So we'll fund um, 40, 45 projects, uh, capacity building projects with Asia. So the, the message is, 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 is getting out there. You know this, um, the projects are typically kind of 800,000, exceptionally a million. They can be joint projects or structural projects. Structural projects differ only in that they have to have the Ministry of Education from the partner country involved. Um, and they, they're trying to get at systemic impact on a, on a country education system, um, as opposed to the joint projects, which are 85% of all that we fund, um, where the, the impact is really at the institutional level. And popular topics, no surprises, um, the same hot topics that there are in Europe in terms of internationalization, um, modernization in all its forms, and um, curriculum reform is, is particularly popular. Something like 45% of all the projects that we saw were, were on one or other aspect of modernization. Um, in terms of uh, subject disciplines, um, again, probably no surprises here. We, we're looking at um, engineering is, is huge. Um, medicine is the one that you can't see, this one here. Um, so medicine and health. Um, education, agriculture, environmental protection, exactly the sorts of things that you would expect would be particularly relevant in um, partner countries, developing countries. We, this thing's great. Um, okay, and then last but not least, um, Jean Monnet. Um, this has been running, you know the Jean Monnet program has been running since I think 1989, so um, it's only a couple of years younger than its, its big brother, Erasmus. Um, one of the things that we had um, when we were starting Erasmus Plus was the, the feeling that the population of Jean Monnet beneficiaries was kind of homogenous. Um, there weren't actually all that many people who looked like this. Um, I put this here, this is aspirational for us. Um, typically it was old white men. Um, so, and when we have um, 
Jean Monnet conferences, we have to be really, really careful that it doesn't look like, like a meeting at the, the um, old folks' home. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to diversify the population and um, make it less of a, of a kind of, uh, you know, the senior professor of European studies in a particular university and try and get some younger researchers, some younger participants involved, more women involved, um, more disciplines involved, because uh, we are getting there, but it's tended to be quite focused on European law, European studies, and we think that there's scope and things that we've seen have been funded, which have you know interesting angles. Um, uh, let me think, um, civil engineering, obviously um, a big kind of European angle because all the codes, uh, I'm married to a civil engineer, all the codes are uh, European rather than national. Um, all sorts of business, trade, um, those sorts of things would be uh, amenable to Jean Monnet, environment policy amenable to Jean Monnet, agriculture. So some of the main policy areas of the European Commission, which had been kind of underrepresented in, in previous years. It was really focusing on, on law and kind of core European studies. So what we're doing is we're trying to reach out and get a little bit more diversity. We're also trying to get it a bit better linked with the EU political priorities. So make sure that when we're funding um, Jean Monnet professors or courses, that we're not just giving the money and then saying, see ya. Um, we're trying to get them to feed back into us because these are, we hope, the best placed professors, researchers in those areas around Europe and around the world. So we're really interested in, in, in what they're working on. And so that's, that's homework for us to try and make sure that we, we, we get the, the results and we use um, some of the, uh, of the impact and the outcomes of the project. So there's also, we also need to do more to, to get out to civil society. I mean, 2016, what a great year. Um, there's, there's clearly um, work to be done for the European Commission to reach out and explain what it's doing. Um, and we can use the Jean Monnet community to do that. And as I said, we're trying to uh, broaden the disciplines. So work in progress. Um, what we've managed to do so far is massively increase the number of applications, which kind of wasn't the idea. So doing all this extra publicity with, with uh, new groups, we've moved from 400 applications in 2014 to more than 1,000 in um, 2016. So mm, um, swings and roundabouts. But we, we have uh, Jean Monnet contractors in 80 countries around the world, so it is an international action. And, uh, but we can do more. And then my, my last slide, well, you've seen it already. Um, I, won't, I won't present it because, uh, Pablo, you mentioned uh, this. It's just for the four international actions when the, uh, when the deadlines are. So they're on um, successive days in, in February. But you'll be getting um, all this information and all the slides um, after, after these days. OK, thank you very much. You, do you want me to take some questions or? Yeah? Alguna pregunta? Alguna pregunta para el doctor Wilkie? Aprovechar que no se escapa, eh? Ahí. Por favor, ahí. Ahora. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. I found it very interesting. I'm quite of new in this, uh, um, not in the field, but in the job. I have now a job related with that. And I would like to ask you for the capaci cap capacity projects. Would you recommend us to focus on neighborhoods as well, or maybe for that type of projects, uh, some countries in Latin America will be a nice target too? In, in fact, for ooh, this is my variety show. Um, in fact, for, um, for the capacity building, the budget is, is a little bit more evenly spread. So actually go where you have political priorities. Um, yes, we have a big budget for the neighborhood, um, and that's always been because, you know, tempers. Um, but there's also reasonable budget for Latin America, and, and Asia, as I mentioned, is this year's biggest budget. So it's, it's a little bit better spread than it is for credit mobility. So go where it makes sense for you, I think, would, would be the answer. Okay, thanks. Especially the cost 
<laughs> Speak to my colleagues in the National Erasmus Plus offices after coffee. They've got plenty of ideas about where you should partner. Um, plenty of ideas. Other questions? Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. No worries. Thank no worries. Bueno, pues si les parece, continuamos con el programa. Como les decíamos anteriormente, vamos a seguir con la presencia de los representantes de los distintos países que hoy nos acompañan. En primer lugar, nos acompañará Parvis y luego nos acompañará también Ivana de Ucrania. Para continuación, intervendrá Mohamed, nuestro querido representante de la Oficina Nacional de Erasmus en Túnez. Y finalmente, pero no, pero no menos importante, María de Serbia. Parvis, whenever you want. Yeah, you have the floor. Right. Buenos días. That's a lot of light. You're right, Graham. <laughs> This is as much as I know in Spanish, but nevertheless, I would like to welcome everybody here today. It's a great pleasure for me to be here because, we, because I was preparing for this day today, and I, I've already knew about that, but I had a great opportunity once again to confirm for myself that we do have a very great history of cooperation, and uh, Graham already mentioned about that through Tempus, and yesterday we were talking with some of the colleagues. We have a great deal of the projects, We carried out some very good successes, some difficulties we had to go through, but nevertheless, this is a good example of uh, cooperation that we had. That's why I named my presentation today Erasmus Plus in Azerbaijan and Possibilities for Cooperation, because as it turned out, given with all the confirmation I had for the projects that we had in the past, there is a very good possibilities that are still available and are still, unfortunately, for Azerbaijan and Spain, in, through the joint cooperation, are not fully uh, yet discovered or exploited. How do I do this? Well, this is Azerbaijan. I think uh, some of you may know already. This is the largest in the South Caucasus region. And the, in the South Caucasus region, there are three countries, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. We have about 10 million of population. And uh, our capital is Baku, is the city of winds, a lot of wind and uh, a lot of sea, because we have the Caspian Sea somewhere here with all the different um, uh, oil uh, fields available for the natural resources. Uh, Azerbaijan is a secular country with all the Muslim and ev everything. We, ha we are very secular. You wouldn't see a lot of people uh, wearing traditional dress. We are just like in, in Europe. Uh, people are very open. People are very friendly. Oops, I think it goes a little bit. Yes, uh, the three-cycle system that we have, you can see that these are already the higher education system in Azerbaijan with uh, the different, um, already for you, familiar aspects of 240 plus 200, uh, 120 credits, four plus two. Um, we have a unified state admission uh, for the student, uh, which is governed by the uh, state, state committee of student administration. This has been like this for almost 25 years now, ever, this, ever since the collapse of Soviet Union. We, are, uh, we have some quality assurance mechanisms at uh, institutional level as well as national level. At national level, we have the accreditation unit at Ministry of Education. And at university level, there are different quality assurance departments for self-assessment surveys, improvement-oriented ones. And we are now working very hard to finalize the national qualification framework. This, this took too long, but this is very important, and everybody understands that. This could be a possible area for cooperation between uh, the different countries. We have 54 universities in Azerbaijan as of 2015, uh, 38 public and 16 private. Um, about, not about, but 163,000 students, that's quite a lot. Oops, it goes a little bit. Yes, uh, we are, uh, no, wait. Yes, 
As far as the EU programs are concerned, we are Bologna process members since 2005, when we joined together with several other countries in uh, Bregen, in, uh, in, in Norway. Through the Bologna process, uh, with, with the EU programs, we have 67 of higher education institutions involved already, and we've been a member of Tempus since 1995. It goes all the way back when we had our first projects. We experience a lot of regional and cross-regional cooperation, as I already mentioned earlier. This is something, and we will have the possibility to discuss this uh, later on, uh, the, the possibility to, uh, uh, to have some discussion over the cross-regional and other possibilities for cooperation, uh, to just to increase your chances maybe, because as we know, that the, 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 the success rate for these programs is not very, very high. Uh, we have had uh, 45 Tempus uh, projects in total, and most of those were carried out in the last period of Tempus, the Tempus 4, which was from 2008 until 2013. We have still some ongoing projects uh, with 26 institutions involved. That's almost a half of the universities that we have, which already shows you uh, how, how much important the, 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 the EU programs and cooperation with European universities for Azerbaijani institutions is. Um, we had six, a total of six uh, national capacity building projects from, for the first round, for the first call in 2015, three, and now we had three more. This may seem less, but for those who, uh, are, who, who are who is familiar with the Tempus and the capacity building, they are aware of the fact that there are different project types. There are national, for instance, and uh, multi-country projects. For the national project, the weight of the project, the budget, is going mostly to the country, to the one country which is involved in the project, which, which one, one uh, partner country. In that case, most of the projects that we had for the last period through capacity building are national projects, given that they wait much longer. They are very heavy projects in terms of the budget, the geographical budget, so don't be surprised that we had less. These are national projects and very serious ones. We have some structural measures projects where we involve um, the ministries, the Academy of Sciences, and all the government bodies. So that's quite a lot. We had uh, 675 uh, credit mobility scholarships in 2015, and 840 are still coming for the years uh, ahead in 2017. Uh, probably with more, more than half of the program countries involved. Uh, and we have a large network, in particular for those newcomers to the program, not only in Spain, in other countries, there is a good network of Tempus experienced public and private universities that not only participated, but applied with lots of projects. They know a great deal about the project, and this is very important. Uh, now I would like to give you oops, doesn't go, uh, some testimonials from some of the students that has been on the mobility. And this is this girl, she was at uh, university in Braganza in Portugal. We are trying to get uh, feedback from them to see how it was for them to study and to get acquainted with what it is like to be in Europe. She was there for 10 months, and you can see that's what she said. It's not one year of your life, but your life in one year. It really is for many students. And this is, for instance, one of the teacher's stuff uh, that was at, in Hungary, also gave a very positive feedback on the cooperation. So this gives you an idea of what people think and uh, why is it important for us to, uh, to, 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 to support this kind of cooperation. Oops, I think, yes, no. Yes, I will go, I will try to go very quickly because we have a lot of slides for that. I couldn't, you know, but we have, had a lot of projects with uh, Spanish universities, already dating in 2004. So 12 years ago, we had the first project where Azerbaijan and Spain were involved. This was a curriculum development project. Two years later, we had another one. Uh, first one with, uh, with Leda, and the second one with uh, the University of Madrid, in Madrid, and Carlos III. And then we had uh, Already other universities, Polytechnical University in 2008, uh, again for curriculum, 
and uh, some governance reform projects with the University of Oldenburg being grant holder, but already uh, with the University of Alicante. And with that, we had many projects with the University of Alicante. You will be seeing that a lot in the next couple of slides. Again, Al Alicante, and I think Rob Roberto, right, the, the name of the co colleague in Alicante University, was very active, not only with Azerbaijan, but with different so South Caucasian countries. Uh, promoting different projects, applying with different projects, and that brought very good results, obviously. Uh, it doesn't work very well. Yes, uh, as you can see here, these are more projects, again, with different coordinators, but with Spanish universities involved. Uh, again, University of Alicante and uh, Granada, I've, I've, I, would, I would say very good also a partner from Spain. We had a lot of interesting projects, uh, project activities with them. Um, the projects were, are mainly for the curriculum development, but we had some uh, for governance reforms as well. Oops, went a little bit. I don't know how should I should I point like this? Yeah. Uh, okay. In 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 uh, 2012, we had only one project with Spain, but again with the University of Alicante, and this the, is the project where coordinator was University from Azerbaijan. That's not typical. I mean, we, we have most of the projects with European universities being grant holder. So that was also a good experience where the grant holder is actually the partner country university. And uh, it, this project was also a big success as well. Now here in 2000, uh, uh, 2013, the last call of Tempus, we had a lot of projects and many of them were with the University of Alicante. <laughs> University of Alicante, University of uh, Malaga and uh, Coruna and all the others. So just to give you an idea, go very, very quickly with that, that we had a lot of, in the past, a lot of activities with uh, the Spanish higher education institutions and in the, even in the, uh, oops, sorry, in the capacity building in higher education, CBHE first call and the second call, we already had uh, the universities in, of Sevilla, Barcelona, and Valencia, and uh, um, Alicante. <laughs> Again, Alicante. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Um, yeah, so this, just to give you an idea that the Tempus heritage continued to be very successful and very much already well thought and uh, experienced. When we go to the uh, credit mobility, unfortunately, and this is something that I would like to urge everybody here, uh, while we do have some projects already, we are hoping that we would have more, just like in the Tempus, where we have a lot of activities going on, and especially given that the, the, the International Credit Mobility Project is not to be compared in terms of difficulty, in terms of preparation phase and everything, with the Tempus project, we are hoping to have more students going to Spain, and uh, in 2016, a total of 22 students will go. This is very good, but again, we, we hope for more, and... Uh, this is something that you can do with Azerbaijani universities. I just, oops. Yeah, the, the, the cooperation areas are all well known to you already. Uh, the capacity building, the credit mobility, and joint master degree programs. But uh, for us, it's a bit difficult because our universities are not always at the level where you would probably, not all of them, but some of them could be a good partners uh, for the joint master degree as well. I would like to speak a little bit, a little bit about, because you can talk about it whole day, I don't want to take much of your time, about the different national priorities because you cannot avoid those. If you want to prepare a capacity building project, you need to focus on the priorities, otherwise your project will be ineligible. And uh, the priorities hasn't changed in the last two or three years maybe, ever since the capacity building call. Um, yeah, two years. And uh, they are the same. As you can see, these are for the joint projects with Azerbaijan. And you can see these are different areas for uh, curriculum development you could think of. Uh, Azerbaijan is very much favoring projects with uh, the engineering because we are the country with lots of natural oil resources. So engineering and engineering trades are, is, is, is the very popular capacity building discipline that is being explored through the project. Oops, I go a little bit. Um, again, you can see, I don't want to read those, but you can already see that 
Uh, we have a lot of different priorities listed by the Ministry of Education in Azerbaijan, and these are very good in terms of uh, cooperation. In particular, if you want to you know, step out a little bit from the popular uh, you know, modernization, as Graham already said, modernization and curriculum development project, these are very good uh, to improve the quality of education, to uh, improve the management and the governance of the universities involved, the quality assurance and mechanisms and uh, different uh, mechanisms for uh, internationalization of higher education institution, development of research, Again, uh, you can see here, this is the last category, category D for the, uh, the, 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 for the university and enterprise cooperation, employability of graduates, and knowledge triangle. These are, for those who did the, the Tempus projects before, these are very well known. Uh, these were before as well. And as you can see here, this is for the regional priorities, and here I'm touching a little, speaking a little bit on behalf of my colleagues in Armenia and, and Georgia, and probably uh, my colleagues in Ukraine will also mention those, but these are the different priorities available if you want to carry out a, a, a regional project with different uh, regional uh, universities involved. You, you can see that here for curriculum development there are less, but still quite a lot of different uh, disciplines available for cooperation. It always speaks, skips one. Uh, here as well, the different categories, as you can see, uh, to improve the management of the universities again, to improve the quality. And of course, these are all the aspects that we will have time to talk during the bilateral sessions outside, uh, during the coffee, after the coffee. You can always approach me or my colleagues to discuss this in further details. And of course, there's always my contacts that are available and uh, you can get them. I will show my, my, my email and we, I can give you my card list, uh, later on so that we can always contact afterwards. And of course, you are free if you want. You don't have to always do it through the National Erasmus Office. You can always, if you have already established good partnerships with the universities in Azerbaijan, you can always uh, just approach them and talk to them. And some of, them, some of those you already met last month, I think, already in Kiev through the contact seminar. So I hope this was a good possibility for you to also, also establish, and I hope so. some projects are already being developed. Yeah, and last category uh, for, the, for, the, for the regional priorities under Erasmus+, Plus. as you can see here, um, again, a good number of different priorities available. I'm saying a good number of priorities available because this is not always the case. Huh? With different countries, you can have only few or one or even sometimes no priorities at all available. Uh, this is a good possibility because really the ENPI East region is very famous for cooperation with, uh, with, with European universities and there are very good uh, tools for that, the possibilities for that. Uh, we have a lot of experienced higher education institutions well, the Baku State is the biggest one, University of Languages, which, is, which was the first Tempos grant holder in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, these are the universities that some of you who did the projects in the past are already familiar with. We have very ambitious universities uh, of Kafka. Maybe some of you already know them because they were quite, quite active in cooperation with uh, the, the, the Spanish higher education institutions. Um, these are my contacts. Basically, if you want to uh, approach me later, uh, call me if you are in Baku for some reason, you want to meet or uh, message me. I'm always available. Our website is here. Uh, I was just talking with my colleagues yesterday. Now there was this new age of social media. We're much more active uh, on, on Facebook because this is where we see that the, you can always find us on Facebook as well. It's National Erasmus Plus office in Azerbaijan. You just search it and it comes up. And there you can already see how many students interact on our, web, on, on our Facebook page, ask questions, receive the re replies. So um, thank you very much. If you have questions, again, I can take them now maybe or later on, it's up to you. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, dear participants. <clears throat> On behalf of the National Erasmus Plus Office of Ukraine, uh, I would like to greet you and to, uh, to send best wishes from Ukraine. Thank you so much for the National uh, Agency in Spain for inviting us for this uh, event and for the opportunity to be, to be with you at this event. So, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> Ukraine. Ukraine has uh, rather an extensive um, uh, history of cooperation within the uh, EU-funded programs, Tempus and Erasmus Plus. Uh, <clears throat> the, at the top part of the uh, slide, you can see the, the history of cooperation within the Tempus uh, program. Uh, Ukraine was involved uh, in the Tempus program since 1993, and uh, here is the history of uh, the uh, projects uh, uh, with participation of the Ukrainian uh, higher education institutions and European institutions. Uh, speaking about uh, Erasmus Plus uh, history, uh, <clears throat> Ukraine uh, right now after after the. Uh, during the third year of participation, uh, is involved in uh, almost 250 projects uh, on uh, international credit mobility, K K1. And um, speaking about the uh, K2, uh, occupancy building in higher education projects we have right now after, after the, uh, uh, after the uh, uh, second call, we have uh, 17 projects. But plus minus one, and then uh, one of the Ukrainian institution, higher education institution, is involved in the strategic partnership uh, projects, and also we have uh, 29 projects uh, within the Jean Monnet uh, activities. Speaking about the history of uh, cooperation between Ukrainian higher education institutions and Spanish uh, higher education institutions, so we also uh, have something to, to show and to be proud of. Uh, <clears throat> when in the Tempus program, uh, Ukrainian, univers uh, Ukrainian universities has cooper had cooperation with 31, um, within 31 uh, projects uh, with the Spanish higher education universities. And right now, within the Erasmus Plus Action CBHE, uh, we have two common projects. Uh, Fab Lab and Game Hub project, and they're right now at the very active stage of, of implementation. They have lots of uh, variety of activities right now. Uh, so, speaking about uh, uh, international credit mobility projects, we have more projects uh, in comparison to the CBHE, of course, uh, and um, uh, we have uh, 61 uh, common pro joint projects uh, on uh, credit mobility with the um, Spanish universities after the results of call uh, 2015 and 2016. And right now, 10 uh, Spanish universities and 21 Ukrainian universities are involved uh, within the action K1. So as, as we see, we have kind of good background and uh, uh, good history. And right now, the, the current uh, situation, uh, speaking, if you speak about the uh, cooperation between Ukraine and uh, Spanish within Tempus and uh, Erasmus Plus programs. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> speaking uh, about uh, the framework of um, uh, current legislation and uh, the conditions which we have within the uh, higher education uh, sphere in Ukraine, we uh, can say that we have uh, rather a uh, good uh, uh, in environment and uh, framework for the effective and um, uh, uh, smooth cooperation, uh, cooperation and implementation of uh, Erasmus Plus programs, uh, uh, projects, uh, uh, and especially if we speak about the Bologna, uh, Bologna space and Bologna uh, <coughs> conditions. So right now, the most uh, kind of uh, but, uh, the most uh, prominent uh, achievement in Ukraine is the uh, adoption of the law of Ukraine on higher education, uh, which was in 2014. And uh, the main achievement of this, uh, of this law is that the Ukrainian university got uh, finally autonomy. 
And uh, right now, the, the Ukrainian universities are learning to take their own responsibilities and to be uh, <clears throat> more active. And uh, they have much more chances for the, for the cooperation um, <clears throat> uh, between the Ukrainian universities and, of course, uh, um, European universities. Uh, so uh, also, we have uh, uh, the list of fields of study and subjects approved. We have. Uh, guidelines for higher education standard development based on ECTS. And uh, I won't go into, into all, all, all those details, but I just wanted to demonstrate to you that uh, the Ukrainian universities are now operating in a kind of favorable um, uh, circumstances and favorable, favorable uh, atmosphere to, to be active and to be, to be effective within the Erasmus Plus uh, projects. So, also, the Ministry of Education of Ukraine is a key uh, beneficiary of the education project in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, is very active in, um, pro in create, still creating the favorable conditions for the Ukrainian universities uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be more active in uh, internationalization and to be more active in the, uh, in the EU-funded um, international projects in the sphere of uh, education and they are promoting uh, their regulations for the activities of the Ukrainian universities and um, um, thanks to, to, to some of the uh, laws and regulations adopted and approved in Ukraine, the Erasmus Plus projects uh, have much more uh, financial auto autonomy, have much more uh, managerial autonomy in their activities. And that, of course, uh, is believed to, to influence uh, uh, into the effective implementation of the Erasmus Plus projects. I, I also won't go into details with, with all those achievements and all those things that uh, <clears throat> our universities obtained right now. But it, uh, I just want to, to give a message that Ukrainian universities uh, have these favorable conditions and have uh, the opportunity to be, to be uh, equal partners and to be, uh, and, and to be effective in the, the Erasmus Plus project, in the project's implementation. So here are some more achievements and some more regulations, which are more, very important for the um, good and smooth uh, and effective implementation of the K-1 International Credit Mobility Projects and CBHE projects. So, sorry. if you speak... So, if you speak about uh, the intensification of cooperation within the in International Credit Mobility uh, projects. Uh, so, what is import important to know right now for, for the Spanish universities while choosing partners. So this is a just uh, this is a complex <laughs> um, picture slide uh, demonstrates you the general idea of the education system in Ukraine. So uh, <clears throat> and uh, because I know that this the Spanish and the Ukrainian system of education differ a little bit. So it, in order to find the the correct uh, uh, level for cooperation, uh, so you may, you may have a look at this and you can understand uh, where, uh, where the universities are and uh, those universities who are uh, <coughs> potential partners for the K-1 projects, uh, where they should be at this, at this system of the higher education uh, uh, in Ukraine. So, um, <coughs> uh, Higher education institutions in Ukraine are considered to be those institutions uh, who provide those three cycles of uh, higher education universities starting from bachelor, master, and then PhD programs. And we have uh, four levels of accreditation of, for higher education institutions in Ukraine. So uh, the universities only of third and fourth higher education universities, uh, higher education institutions of third and fourth level of accreditations are eligible for participation in the Erasmus Plus program. So 